and Ray uh, Longfellow. He loved books and he yearned to be a literary talent. He attended Bowdoin College and afterward traveled to Europe to study modern languages. And upon his return, he began teaching at Bowdoin, and in 1831, he married Mary Storer Potter. During a second period of study in Europe, word reached him that his wife of three years had died after miscarrying their child. He returned stateside, grief-stricken, and took up a solitary existence until, he, until introduced to Francis Appleton. Francis became his inspiration and after seven years of refusals, finally consented to marriage. On Christmas Day in 1863, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was inspired to write the poem we now know as the Christmas Carol, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day was born out of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's depression. Longfellow had fallen into depression in 1861 when his second wife, Frances, died. She had been sealing envelopes with hot wax when a flame caught her clothes on fire, and Henry rushed to her aid and tried to smother the flames. By the time the fire was out, Frances had been burned beyond recovery. She died the next day. Henry, burned badly as well, was too sick to attend her funeral. The death marked a turning point in Longfellow's life. His physical appearance changed dramatically as he began growing his beard because of the burns disfigured his face, and mentally he sank into depression. Winning Francis' affection had taken Longfellow years, and their 18-year marriage was the happiest time of his life. In the wake of her death, he spent much of his time translating other works and less on his own creation. But in the Christmas of 1862, the first Christmas after her death, Longfellow wrote in his journal, how inexpressibly sad are all holidays. On another occasion, he described himself to a friend as inwardly bleeding to death. Nearly a year after Francis' passing, he penned, I can make no record of these days, Better leave them wrapped in silence. Perhaps Sunday, God will give me peace. He also would record in his journal, A Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. And even 18 years later, he would be still be mourning Francis's loss when he wrote The Cross of Snow, a poem. And that poem is this. In the long sleepless watches of night, night a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall, where round its head the night lamp cast a hail of pipe, a, a halo of pale light. Here in this room she died, and soul more white, never through martyrdom of fire was led to a repose, nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedite or blessed. There is a mountain in the distant west that, sun-defying in its deep ravines, displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast. These eighteen years through all the changing scenes, and the seasons changeless since the day she died. In 1863, Longfellow suffered another blow. The poet was a staunch abolitionist, but he, like the entire country, was troubled by civil war. His son Charlie, in the March of 1863, had decided that regardless of his father's wishes, he would join the fight. He ran off to Washington to enlist in the 1st Massachusetts Artillery. A friend posted a letter for him after he left, and it was a, a letter by his son Charlie. Dear Papa, you know for how long a time I have been wanting to go to war. I have tried hard to resist the temptation of going without your leave, but I cannot any longer. I feel it would be my 
my first duty to do what I can for my country, and I would willingly lay down my life for it, if it would be of any good. God bless you all. Yours affectionately, Charlie. Charlie's commanding officer soon discovered the boy's influential family ties and promoted Charlie to lieutenant. Charlie believed his aunt had probably helped him procure the nomination of commission for him. Longfellow feared for his son's future. In June, Charlie came down with a fever. Longfellow went to Washington and brought him back to spend summer on leave at the family cottage in Massachusetts. Though committed to the fight, the romance of war was stripped away for Charlie in the coming months of battles. In one letter home, he described seeing a fellow soldier lose his leg and other close calls. And he wrote, They may call the gaiety of the soldier's life, but it strikes me as pretty earnest work when the shells are ripping and tearing your men to pieces. In November, Charlie's luck ran out. At New Hope, Virginia, he was engaged in the battle and he was shot. The bullet went through him from back to shoulder, just nicking his spine. Again, Longfellow traveled to Washington to retrieve his son from the hospital. They arrived back at their Cambridge home on December 8th, and a grim Longfellow set about the months-long process of trying to nurse his son back to health. Lieutenant Charles Longfellow did not die, one of the Lord's tenderest mercies. Although Longfellow had no way of knowing that this when he wrote this poem, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. The circumstances challenged his resolve, but he was inspired when he heard the bells. He found them in a message that peace would come again to a troubled nation, and they inspired him to write this poem. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, the old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The, and thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon runder, thundered in the south. And when and with the sound of carols drowned, of peace of, on earth, goodwill to men. It was an, as if an earthquake rent the hearthstone's continent, and made forlorn the house, households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to, to men. And that is the story of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's um, writing of that poem. And it says, Charlie never did return to the fight, despite his wish to. He was honorably discharged in February of 1864. Longfellow's poem, published originally in a magazine, would be set to music, but the middle stanzas often removed. Longfellow's bowed but unbroken faith in Jesus Christ gave him perspective and strength to carry on. It fortified him through the trials and vicissitudes of life. And that's the story behind that Christmas carol. And to me, there is hope, and that is in, in despair. We might be living in a world of despair. We might be living in a world that you know, is, seems almost impossible for us to return to the old normal and going back the way we used to be, and it probably won't, but we still have one thing that will never change, and that is our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we can't, the past cannot be changed. They can tear down statues, 
but we will still have the Word of God. And that's one fact that we cannot change, is the fact that he died on the cross. He came to earth. He was born with the purpose to die for us, so that we would be rise together with him. And that's our hope in the midst of all this world and in this despair. We have hope in Christ. And like I said, the, the thing that I understand the most is that he came to earth, and he came to earth as a baby to die for our sins. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's, it kind of rounds out everything that we look at. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is known as the resurrection chapter. I won't read the whole thing, but I want to read a few verses from that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. This next verse, I think, is key. It says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That, I believe, really sums up why he came to earth. The most important thing, his death and his resurrection. Paul the Apostle says that he is the firstfruits of us. He is the firstborn. And he, when he adds, in the likeness of his resurrection, we too will be risen from the dead to live with him forever. And that, to me, is the reason for this season that we celebrate his birth. It points to the most wonderful thing that he has ever, ever done. And that is he lived a perfect life after his birth. And when he died on the cross, he took our sin and he gave us his righteousness on the cross. Let's uh, sing, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. I don't have, <clears throat> I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I'm not even sure if that's in the hymn, and I'm not even sure if I know the tune for that. I've heard that there's like four or five different tunes for that. But it was a wonderful story, and I wanted to share that. Number three.